First of all, Jazakumullah for to my young one brothers and one sisters for arranging arranging this conference. May Allah SWT bless you immensely, inshallah. That I know how much effort goes into putting one conference like this. May Allah SWT reward you immensely. Ameen, Ya Rabbi. I'll just share two stories with you. Uh, and Alhamdulillah, because it's uh, morning is, according to some psychologists, it's a golden hour, the first hour when you wake up. Uh, so let's let's do this, inshallah. If I'll find you sleeping, I'll actually throw a question on you. This applies to both. It's a gender exclusive activity, inshallah. Uh, let's let's do this, inshallah. I'll tell you two stories. One from our history of Mongols. Second is the history of Harun alayhi salam and Musa alayhi salam. Let's start, inshallah. If I have to ask you, which fitna, which fitna was the biggest fitna which this ummah has faced in the history of fourteen hundred years? What do you think? Trial fitna, in terms of the intensity, what do you think? Huh? She has a knee split. But it's, it's not a biggest fitna which caused harm on the ummah in and of itself. That caused a threat that ummah will be wiped off. It never was like that. She has only existed from the time of the beginning, but it never threatened the existence of the ummah in and of itself. Yes. Huh? Yeah, I can't hear you. Liars? Liars? Desires. Okay. Desires. Desires. Abdullah, what do you say? I can't hear you. The Jal. The Jal. The Jal is not. Okay. The Jal is somewhere, but we don't know if he has arrived, right? So you haven't posed a threat at this point. I'm talking about what happened in this Ummah in the last 1400 years, which scholars have said. Two to three things happened that was the biggest fitna. Yes. Mongol invasion. That's what we really talk about. And I'll tell you why it was such a big threat. And this is connected to our topic of legacy. Ottoman Empire. Demise or decline of the Ottoman Empire. That's the last thing uh, which ended the Muslim Khilafah. And the first is apostates. At the time of Abu Bakr Siddiq, when Rasulullah passed away, everyone was going back to their previous religion. And then Abu Bakr Siddiq with his strategy, Alhamdulillah, brought most of those people back. Let's talk about Mongol invasion. In 7th century of this Ummah, 7th century of this Ummah, a fitna came with the name of Mongol invasion. Or in other words, you can say Tartar. It was such a big fitna, such a big fitna, it caused bloodbath among all the Muslim cities. By the way, before the Mongol invasion happened, there was inner weakness around 7th century within Muslim community. Muslims were fighting for titles tooth and nail. They were power hunger people they within Muslim community. That we were going to pull your leg and we will come in the leadership position. So that's what happening. Everyone was concerned about themselves instead of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There were ethics, akhlaq, morality wise, they were very weak. So there was internal weakness. And when you have this internal weakness, then you have an external threat also. This army came from Mongol area. They attacked from the eastern side of Islam. The first city they attacked was Bukhara. Bukhara. You know what, how they attacked? They killed every individual in that city did not leave a single person. So I'm just giving you things in perspective. If if Mongol back in the days, let's say Richardson is Bukhara, what they would do, they would kill every individual living in the city without leaving any mark. Isn't that threatening? The news is spread in the entire Muslim community, Muslim Khilafah, that Mongols, whenever they will come, they will kill everyone. So there was a fear. Then they start moving towards West. And the fear was increasing. Muslim army was first of all already very weak because of the situation in the past. And then this fear was there. 
when they came to the capital, the capital at that time was Baghdad, Iran. You know what they did, Mongols? 2.5 million people used to live in Baghdad at that time. Vast majority Muslim, it was Muslim capital. Mongol came, he started killing people, and out of 2.5 million, they killed 1.8 million Muslims. Think about it, brothers and sisters. 1.8 million Muslims in Baghdad. For 40 days, historians Ibn Afir says, for 40 days, for 40 days, they were killing left and right, and the dead bodies were piling, so much so that they did not have a time and a strategy to bury the dead body. Then when that body started to decompose outside, diseases spread from Iraq to Damascus. People in Damascus were falling sick because of the disease. So many dead bodies. Some of the historians would say their horses were drowned in the blood as they were killing the Muslims. And only those people survived who didn't come out of their house, they hid in their house. Then they went to Damascus, then they went to Syria. Some of the historians like Sheikh Abul Hassan Ali Nadawi, he said, some of the historians of that time, around 7th century, they said there was a fear, apart from Egypt, they defeated everything. Egypt was the only one, the only army who gave them hard time and defeated once was Egypt. Every other Muslim city, they conquered. The historian said that there was a fear that if they will survive like this, they will going to wipe the entire Ummah away from the face of the earth. Can you imagine this? Then what happened? How did we survive then? Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave ability to the da'i and his scholars of Islam to do which our soldiers could not do. Can anyone imagine how did he survive then after this brutal massacre? Can anyone imagine? Can anyone? What happened then? Everyone was afraid if they will come, our armies and were not capable to fight them except the Egyptian army. They actually accepted Islam because few scholars invited them and preached them. And now the brutal attackers of Islam became the defenders of Islam. SubhanAllah. Why am I telling you this story? Obviously, I was preparing this for my Ahmad class. So I was saying this is this is great example to teach all of you. We don't know anything about those anonymous scholars. Who were those scholars? What was their Facebook ID? What was their Twitter account? What was their TikTok account? Where they were their YouTube shorts videos? No. We don't know anything about that group of scholars who saved the entire Ummah. Were they better in terms of legacy than as compared to a TikTok Muslim influencer, brother or sister, who's making short videos so that his name can get viral? Were those scholars better? What do you think? And that's what our topic is today. How do you define the legacy? You know, subhanAllah, we are living in a Western civilization and we are constantly getting this message which dilutes our mind. And I'll tell you what, even how legacy is defined in Western culture. But before that, in Western culture, God is being removed. You already have attended some of you in my history classes. God is being removed a few years back. And now we are very self-centric, not God-centric. We are very self-conscious, not God-conscious. How I can become famous, how I can become wealthy, how I can make a video which can go viral, and maybe Ummah will going to see, but my name will prevail. That is the mentality when I'm thinking about legacy. And these messages are constantly being given. How many of you go to gym? Can you raise hand? How many of you go to gym? First of all, those of you who don't, please go to gym. <laughs> I usually go to 24 hour fitness. I'm not telling you which city, but 24 hour fitness. So I saw the message a few days back. And when you were thinking about self centered versus God centric, and then you start looking at the world, you will see those examples also. One of the messages, uh, 
one of the signs at the gym, they said, you deserve to be healthy. You deserve to be healthy. If you think there's no issue with this problem, this sign. But in Islam, we don't see the word from self-centric standpoint. We see the word from Allah-centric standpoint. Why do I have to be healthy? Because Allah said through his messenger, a strong believer is better and beloved in the sight of Allah than a weak believer. I need to be strong because Allah has asked me to become strong. But now you have removed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything circulates around you. Every day, everything does tawaf of you, yourself. It's a very egocentric personality which we are being, uh, which environment where we are being raised in the West. Hence, you see this, you deserve to be healthy, you deserve to be happy. Similarly, mixed messages are being given through our Disney and Hollywood garbage. Everything is about finding your true self. Finding your true self. Be yourself. Be your authentic self. Versus, when you come to Islam, does a law centric person can even think of being himself? No. You need to submit yourself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sometimes you will do something in Islam which might go against your feeling. But at the end of the day, that is what is best for you in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But in the Western civilization, everything is so disturbed, subhanAllah, in terms of self-centric versus Allah-centric. I'll come to the legacy. How many of you have cell phone right now? Can you raise hand? How many of you have cell phone? Can you Google right now? Legacy means, right? Legacy means. And read the first thing which pops up. Legacy meaning or legacy means. What shows up? Tell me. What's the meaning of legacy? According to Sheikh Ruben Hafiz of Allah, Tell me. So it's materialistic. Money, amount, materialistic. Did you see what I was talking about? It's all about you, your materialism, your materialistic things, what you have left for the world, and that's how your legacy will be gauged. Now tell me one thing, brothers and sisters. Some of the companions, when they passed away, we know that they were poor. Right? Did they leave a good legacy? But according to this Western standard of legacy, they were failures. But in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they were far better than any of these people who have left million dollars, but no meaning. Before we can even hear these phenomenal speeches of today, change your worldview. We define legacy in a different angle. We don't have this materialistic angle. And wallahi, wallahi, it impacts us in our, even in our Islamic world. The person who made this flyer of this conference, I don't even know that. But you did a great job, mashallah. Have left a bigger legacy as compared to me and other speakers because we have a fear of riyadh and showing off and arrogance. He has followed the way of those scholars, those anonymous scholars who have left their legacy in the Mongol invasion. But the people who are coming to Mike and MC and others, and may Allah protect our young brother Saad and Irtaza and whoever is doing that, uh, the sisters who are doing that. But we have to redefine what legacy means for us. Legacy is not to get the exposure of the people, to get the time of the people, so that people will know me, myself, my name, my fame, my money. That's not the legacy. These are secondary things. Primary thing is, you are part of one Ummah. My legacy is my Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask me how much I contributed for this Islam. And this is exactly how we should think. Alone we are nothing. Alone we are nothing. So this is the first story I wanted to share. And now let's discuss the second story and I'll be done with that inshallah. Okay. Let's just start with the second story inshallah. This the legacy of Musa and Harun salam. There's a beautiful dua of Musa and Harun in Surah Taha. We will see beginning of Surah Taha and we will see end of Surah Taha. Okay? Which dua of Musa salam we are teaching our kids to memorize before they would speak, before they come to speaking. Can you remember? 
Okay, come to Shrabli. Do you know the context of this? I'll tell you brief context and then inshallah we'll read this dua collectively inshallah. Usually we pay attention to the first part of this dua, but today I want to pay attention to the part of the dua which usually don't pay attention. Okay. Musa Islam was raised in Egypt. He was actually raised in the castle of Pharaoh, Pharaoh. Luxurious life. Then one day he was going in the streets of Egypt. He found two people arguing, fighting with each other. He went with the intention of reconciliation. He punched one guy. Musa Islam was very muscular, by the way, very strong. Then one punch was more than enough and the person died. And then long story short, the news is spread that we need to do something and then the army of Pharaoh, the police of Pharaoh, they started looking for Musa and actually this was the news which Musa received and Musa Islam went from Egypt to Madian. You know this, right? Okay. Now he stayed there for X number of years. He got married there and that's obviously another story for young people to know about how Musa got married. It's a beautiful story by the way. I don't want to go into the tensions. Um, but that is for YM conference also. How Musa got married with his wife. Incredible story. Then, after spending some time, we know the story from Surah Taha in the beginning. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to Musa alayhi salatu wa salam. Allah says, you are being selected as a prophet and you have to go where? Where? What's your job description? Where do you have to go? To Pharaoh. This is the last place where Musa is not want to go because he ran from Pharaoh. And you have to go to Egypt. This last place where Yusuf Islam wants to go. So it's a very difficult task. It's a very difficult task. Musa Islam asked for a few dua. And these duas are extremely important for any da'i, for all of us. He said, What? Rabbish Shahni Sadri. Oh Allah, give me confidence. This is a shallow translation. Open my chest for me. It's a long detail. But give me confidence. Remove the fear of consequences of talking to Musa, talking to Firaun. Give me confidence. From Shahri Sadri. Wayasirli Amri. And make this job easy for me. Talking to Firaun, going back to Egypt is difficult. Make this job easy for me. Wahlul Rukhdatam min Lisani. Remove the impediment from my speech. It was said that Musa Islam had a stutter in his speech. According to some narrations. Some others only said something else. But remove the impediment from my speech. What did he say? Did they say you hate Bukawli in Facebook? He said, Yafkahu Kawli. So that they may understand. The purpose of my speech to Pharaoh, so that people understand. The ministers will understand. Not that they will like my speech on Facebook. No, no, no. We know this dua. And Yafqahukoli, but dua continues, and that is very important now for us. Then he says, And appoint a helper from my house. Harun Akhi. Harun, my brother. Make him a prophet also. He will be to help me, he strengthen me. Through his efforts, through his skills. What shirik hufi amri. And he will share some of the tasks which you are giving to me. And we both will glorify you. We both will praise you. What's going on here? There are a few things going on here. First, Musa alayhi salam. Know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has asked him to go to Firaun. It's a very challenging task for him. So first thing he's asking after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this task easy for me. First thing he's asking is communication skills. His own communication skills. So basically he's focusing on his self-development. But then he's asking for something which modern day leadership courses are teaching you. And that is importance of teamwork. By the way, this mashallah, it's a little heavy, right? Yafi, if I will ask you, can you move this, lift this up, and take this outside in the Salah area? You would say, Mama says, you are overestimating me, right? I might need help of Irtaza or Saad, right? Even removing this podium alone is not possible, right? How can you change the entire situation in this home by being alone? 
can you just do the moving of your house alone or do you need some help? Just changing the situation of your house, you need help of others. How can you bring the Ummah from darkness to light? By your alone efforts. You need help of others, right? Musa salam, was extremely talented. Allah made him prophet. But he said, alone I'm nothing. I need help. I need help of Harun. Harun, becoming a prophet, he will help me. This is extremely, extremely important. We are living in a very self-centric society. If you will ask me, Mama, if we want to make a video on Facebook, we saw that you wrote a book on Islamic paradigm of LGBTQ, you should make the videos. And if I know that, let's say, a more prolific speaker is in the town, and he's more knowledgeable on this topic, as a sincere person, I would say, go to him, ask him to make video, because the video should be powerful. He is a prolific speaker. He's more knowledgeable. It's not about me. My name is about him. But if I'm thinking from a self-centric standpoint, I say, no, mashallah. I'll get a few views. I'll get viable. Uh, let's do the retake. I want proper smiling face in that video. This is exactly like a plague eating our ummah right now. Very self-centric approach. Remember what Musa Islam says, Haruna akhi. Allah, before I can go to Firaun, make Harun a prophet. Think about it, brothers and sisters. How much time do I have? Zero second? Okay. Okay. Just give me two minutes. Okay. Ustad Dabdur is here. He's here. Oh, sorry. Okay, I'll, I'll finish, inshallah. Allah, but where else? Uh, yeah. Harun Akhi. Um, so he said that appoint Harun Islam as a prophet. Think about it. Why Harun? Because in Surah Shura, he says, Wa afsah minni. He's a profound speaker. Musa Islam had a stutter, and Harun was a profound speaker. So Musa Islam said, Allah's message, Allah's being need to be conveyed. It should be conveyed by the best speaker, not by me, but by the best speaker. That's teamwork for you. That's teamwork for you. Think about it. And then they ended, I'll end with this. And then they asked Musa and Harun so that we both can praise you, we both can glorify you. All these magical phrases in the modern day leadership, teamwork, motivation, these are fruitless. These are fruitless in modern day legacy if you don't have a spirituality in your team. Because in the same Quran, in other part of the Quran, we are learning that the brothers will almost kill each other for becoming prophet if they don't have a spirituality. You know which part? Surah Yusuf. Ten brothers attempted to murder Yusuf Ali Salam because they wanted the title. And here we are saying Musa Islam is asking for the leadership uh, for asking for Harun to become a prophet. This is what we need. We need a teamwork. This is our legacy. Our legacy is how Islam's condition is. Our legacy is not about our self-centric approach, about our condition. I ask the Muslim to give us um, opportunity and tawfiq and sabat inshallah.